Good day, everyone. Uh, I would like to welcome all uh, you to APRU Sustainable Waste Management Virtual School on Life Cycle Assessment and Life Cycle Sustainability Assessment for Global Sustainability. I am Amasha Vitana, a PhD scholar at Korea University, and I am going to host this event. Before starting today's event, I would like to invite Pavani Disanayake to provide some technical instructions for the webinar logistics for the attendees. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being with us in the APRU Sustainable Waste Management Virtual School on Life Cycle Assessment and Life Cycle Sustainability Assessment for Global Sustainability. As Samasha mentioned, I'm going to collaborate with the webinar logistics today. This is the webinar mode, so you can listen and see the panelists. We have enabled two chats. You can ask questions from our speaker or panelist anytime through Q&A chat. And on general chat, you could leave comments or share important information. If you're interested to talk and ask questions, Please raise your hand so that I will unmute you and um, you can interact directly with the speaker. As it is an international event, we kindly recommend you to use the English name all the time. Besides, if you have any problem or issue during the event, please feel free to send a message to me so that I will try to help you. We hope you will enjoy the event. Thank you. Thank you, Pavani. APRU Sustainable Waste Management a Virtual School on Life Cycle Assessment and Life Cycle Sustainable, Sustainable for Global Sustainability is organized by the APRU SWM program, where Professor Yong Sik Ok at Korea University serves as the director of the program. The program is co directed by Professor William Mitch at Stanford University and Professor David Wardley at Nanyang Technological University. Today's lecture will be delivered by Professor Han Wei Kua from National University of Singapore. The title of the lecture is Life Cycle Assessment and Life Cycle Sustainability Assessment for Global Sustainability. So uh, at the end of the presentation, there will be a Q&A session. I encourage all the attendees to participate the event actively and come up with your questions for the discussion. Now, I would like to invite Pavani Disanayake to give the welcome address. Thank you, Amasha. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it is a great honor for me to give the welcome address. As you know, the development of sustainable waste management strategies has become a major concern throughout the world. APR Sustainable Waste Management Program was initiated focusing on recycling and recovery of waste materials while paving the way towards circular economy, especially focusing EPILA in ESG. APRU has a membership of presidents of 55 leading universities from around the Pacific Rim. And this includes 2 million students and 200,000 academic staffs. The APR Sustainable Waste Management Program hosted by the Korea University offers a timely opportunity for knowledge exchange among professionals from all over the world to assist the formulation of an efficient sustainable waste management agenda. As you know, uh, APR Sustainable Waste Management program have consistently tried to carry out a variety of programs designed to accelerate academic activities and uh, international corporations. APR Sustainable Waste Management Virtual School is a part of regular range of events offered by the APR Sustainable Waste Management program, and it is designed to offer the audience an insight view of cutting edge research topics. As you know, a life cycle assessment is the most reliable method to verify environmental impacts. So this, uh, this virtual school is designed to provide sound knowledge on life cycle assessment and life cycle sustainability assessment to students, academics, and researchers in member universities of APRU Sustainable Waste Management Program. I believe that the 
participants will be able to learn from and interact with world renowned scientists around the world through this lecture. I hope that this event will become a valuable opportunity to extend and share friendship among the people who are participating in this webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pavani. Now we will move to the APRU Sustainable Waste Management Virtual School on Life Cycle Assessment and Life Cycle Sustainability Assessment for Global Sustainability. It's a great honor for me to introduce our speaker, who is Professor Han Weikua from National University of Singapore. Before starting the lecture, I would like to give a brief introduction about Professor Kua. Professor Han Weikua, who is an associate professor from the Department of Built Environment and currently is the assistant dean of the School of Design and Environment at National University of Singapore. Professor Kua has published about 100 articles, reports, and chapters of several books on bio-based building materials, life cycle sustainability assessment, and sustainable building policies. In many of these publications, he is either sole or lead author. He has received 70 different international national academic awards and honors, including some from his alma mater, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He has been invited by local and international organizations to deliver lectures and speeches as a guest lecturer on the research 82 times, including as an invitation by the American Center for Life Cycle Assessment and Editor-in-Chief of Journal of Industrial Ecology to conduct a webinar on life cycle sustainability assessment. Professor Kua consults for its Professor Kua consults for the Singapore uh, for a Singaporean government on environment and uh, issues and has helped to set up a corporate sustainability guidelines for companies with more than 2 billion Singaporean dollars in combined annual turnover. He is currently involved in collaboration with various groups in China, USA, Italy, Colombia, South Africa, and Saudi Arabia on biochar building materials, life cycle assessment of building materials, and construction 3D printing. Professor Kua, over to you. Thank you very much uh, for the very kind introduction. And uh, um, thank you very much also to um, APRU, um, sustainable waste management um, program for creating this uh, um, awesome series of talks and for having me and uh, inviting me to be a speaker. So I would like to share my slides for this afternoon. The title of my talk today is on LCA, which stands for Life Cycle Assessment, and uh, LCSA, which stands for Life Cycle Sustainability Assessment for Global Sustainability. So uh, this is the contents of my uh, presentation this afternoon. Instead of going straight and uh, directly into LCA, I would like to start by giving you um, the bigger picture, the background of having LCA and LCSA in the first place. And with that, um, I will have to, uh, of course, start with this uh, wholesome concept known as industrial ecology. So the objective of uh, the talk this afternoon is to hopefully um, get you to appreciate the background of story of uh, uh, IE, industrial ecology, and then from there, familiarize yourselves with the key concepts and idea of LCA and LCSA. I think we all know, we are all um, seasoned researchers in this field of uh, sustainable development in our own ways, that um, we are going to have many, many more mouths to feed in the near future. All right. By 2050, the projected world population is almost 10 billion people. And coming from that st uh, statistics, is the idea that we are going to have so much more resources um, um, requirement in order to cater to the needs of these people. 
In fact, back in uh, 2019, um, there was such a map known as the World Consumption uh, Cartogram or World Consumption Map um, that you can uh, easily find on the internet. And basically, a map of this nature shows you the concentration of the world consumption of resources around the world. And without going to the specifics, you can see where these different countries are. And of course, where we are now in, um, in Asia, for example, we are somewhere around here. So you can see from the color, the tone of the colors, where we are heading towards. But why are we so concerned about increased consumption in the future? Consumption itself, I think it's um, inevitable and it is nothing to, 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 to be feared but it is the, the results of the consumption that should get us all thinking about and reflecting. It is about creating of waste that we are so far either unable to recycle or to do it in a sustainable manner. It is also about depletion of natural resources, about how our pace of depletion is now outstripping the pace of mother nature's ability to regenerate herself. Last but not least, it is also about how our consumption of resources has already resulted in uncontrolled emission into the atmosphere, into the water, and of course, into land. And of course, along this line, it is always the debate on climate change with the emission of greenhouse gases. So what can we do about it? There's always this question about how much we can learn from Mother Nature and how much that we can learn from Mother Nature that we can use to modify the way we operate and the way we think. One of the key lessons that Mother Nature has taught us through the years is the ability to heal and regenerate itself. And over here, you can see how different organisms come together to form what we call the nitrogen cycle. And for that matter, there are many different cycles, the carbon cycle and so on and so forth. But the most distinct feature is the ability of regeneration when different stakeholders or different components, all right, in the ecosystem come together and work closely, seamlessly with one another. So it is not too long ago that we have two visionaries by the name of uh, Professor Robert Frosch. Um, he was still in Harvard University until a few years ago. I, I had a, the pleasure of meeting him a good five, six years ago in the US. And of course, his uh, research partner, Nicholas uh, Galopoulos. And uh, in 1989, in that um, memorable edition of uh, Scientific American, they mentioned something for the first time all right, and that term used was industrial ecology. And that came from the series of questions that they asked about the way we have all along been using resources. They asked, why would not our industrial system behave more like an ecosystem where waste of a certain species may be a resource of another species? Why not? So it is through all these analogies, drawing of analogies between the natural and social technical systems that they got us all thinking and develop this concept of, develop, um, of uh, industrial development in which there's a shift of industrial processes from the linear flow, all right, in which resources and capital investment move through the system to become waste to one which is circular in nature, where waste becomes input for new processes. In other words, it is about a concept of waste equal food. So based on this general concept of industrial ecology, different uh, groups of uh, researchers around the world came together and created different pockets of efforts focusing on different methodology and approaches. And life cycle assessment is one of them. And of course, it's one of the long list of methodologies under industrial ecology, which includes urban metabolism, material flow analysis, industrial symbiosis, which is, describes how 
materials flow in and among a network of companies in an industrial park setting, for example, and how, for example, dematerialization and decarbonization can be used as a way to redesign products. But of course, in order to stay focused, let us now look at only life cycle assessment and use that as a basis for understanding the concept of life cycle sustainability assessment. So what is, what is LCA? To understand fully what is LCA, we need to know the concept of life cycle. I'm not sure about um, the educational contents and program in your, uh, in your respective country, but in, uh, in Singapore, uh, when I was uh, in primary school, and that was a long, long, long time ago, all right, we first learned about life cycle by looking at animals, talking about drawing inspiration from Mother Nature. Right, we learn about life cycle of frogs, of house flies, and so on. So all these different stages, as I'm indicating now with my pointer, each one of them represent a life cycle stage. So if we are going to apply this technique, this thinking, all right, this concept to a material in a process of construction, all right, you find that you can break the material into the different life cycle stages as shown here. Raw materials extraction is one life cycle stage. Recycling is another life, uh, life cycle stage and so on. So what is LCA? If you use a life cycle diagram to describe LCA, it will be so much clearer. Let's take one particular life cycle stage. If for this stage, we account for what goes in, in a form of energy and materials and the impact as a result of the input of energy and materials. And we also account for what flows out in a form of wasted energy and waste. And we account for the impact caused by these outflows. And if we do this, accounting for inflow and outflow, for each and every one of these life cycle stages, and we sum them up, essentially that is what LCA is about. It is that simple. All right, very straightforward. But of course, as many things in life, okay, I may sound philosophical here, many things seem simple, but when it's down to doing it, it's extremely difficult and it's extremely difficult to do them well. And I will show you that in a moment. So for one of a definition, LCA is a process to evaluate the environmental burdens associated to a product or process by taking on a life cycle perspective and accounting for these burdens all the way from the raw material extraction stage to the end of life treatment stage. That is the most complete LCA that we can ever do. And in a while, I'll show you that there are also other more truncated, condensed way of doing LCA. Okay, so that will come in a few minutes. What are the benefits of LCA? At least conceptually, it is a very holistic way of doing environmental assessment. And because we are using numbers here, the assessment is quantitative in nature, which allows us for easy comparison of products and design, which can then lead to either design revisions or even policy changes. So is that a widely and internationally recognized way of doing LCA out, uh, out there. Fortunately, yes. Otherwise, we'll be doing our own version of LCA. Nobody knows what is the more correct way of doing it. All right, so that internationally recognized LCA framework is known as the International um, uh, Standard ISO 14040. So what I'm gonna do now is to give you an overall idea of what are expected from us if we are going to use the ISO 14040 framework for doing LCA, starting from the very first step of goal and scope definition. Here we go. All right. In goal, in goal and scope definition, we have to define, there's no surprise here, the goal and the scope. So what are these? 
From the next slide onwards, I'll show you what and the questions to ask when you set your goal and scope. Next, we have to determine what is the functional unit. Very, very important. Oh, before I go on, I just want to remind you that when you get into LCA, the technicality of LCA, there are many terminology that just by reading it, you will not know what it means. Functional unit, this term is one example. But when you understand what it means within the scope of LCA, it will be so much easier for you to not only understand, but to remember what that means, okay? Another term that is very difficult to understand is system boundaries. What is that? What is system boundary anyway, all right? In the lingo or as a lingo of LCA, it basically means the life cycle stages, okay, that you have chosen for your LCA, as well as the geographical, okay, geographical origin of each of these life cycle stages. For example, I may be building a house in Singapore, but the cement that I use based on the raw materials that I've extracted, all right, may not, and most likely will not come from Singapore. It will come from mostly either Japan, China, or Malaysia. So that is what I mean by identifying the geographical region within the system boundary. Right now, let me go into the details, okay? Because this is a, a summer school, so I intend to go deeper into the details here. The first question you must ask for goal definition is, why do you even need to do an LCA, right? LCA may be good, may be nice, all right? The kind of information you can get out of it can actually be quite impressive because of the level of details, but you must know that it takes a lot of time. So do you really want to do LCA? If you do, who are the primary audience? Knowing your audience will then help you to set the overall goals of your study, which is the third point here. For example, if the government agency is interested in an LCA, all right, they being the target, then you will need to find out from them whether they are primarily interested in carbon emission. So if the answer is yes, then you all you have to do is to focus on the carbon emission aspect of the LCA, which I'm going to teach you in a moment. Finally, for your study, is it sufficient just to account for inflows and outflows? Or are you also interested in the impacts caused by these inflows and outflows? What are the difference? An example of inflow is energy consumption. An example of outflow is carbon dioxide or your carbon emissions, all right? So the impact of carbon emission is global warming potentials. So in LCA, you can either present your results in the form of carbon emission, which is in the form of outflows, or in the, you can also present it in the form of the impact caused by the outflow. In the case of uh, carbon emission, the impact will be global warming potential. So there is an additional step for you to take if you want to calculate the, the impact and not just the outflow. I'll talk about this in a while as well. When it comes to scope definition, it gets a little bit more involved. And I'm going to give you specific examples on, of, of this. First, firstly, what are the products or objects you're interested in? It can be, all right, it can be very complicated. And I'm just going to use something which is almost unassuming as a computer monitor. Next, list down the following items. What are the parts and components of the computer monitor? You have the glass, okay? You have the plastic casing, you have the electronics and so on and so forth. And then you have to figure out whether you're just looking at the electronics. For example, you are doing an LCA on e-waste, okay, from computer accessories, for example. All right. In that case, you only look at the electronics. But you are looking at the entire object, the computer monitor, you have to look at the glass as well in which case you have to account for the mass, expected lifetime of all these selected components. Thirdly, you have then to decide for yourself what are the parts and components to consider. As I mentioned just now, I've seen studies on computer accessories 
not looking at all the different components in that accessory. For example, in computer monitor, they just look at the electronics. And one of the reasons for them to do that is that they want to look at how they can salvage, they can, they can recycle some of the precious matter in these electronics, right? Or even prevent the leaching of toxic matter from electronics. Those are very specific LCA. Next. Once you have decided what are the parts and components to study, you have then to decide the very, very important unit of assessment, which is known as the functional unit. Functional unit is quantity of the parts and the selected components for which the LCA is done. And there are two common ways of doing so. Number one is to do a quantity-based functional unit. That means you define the functional unit of let's say concrete as one kg, meaning that your LCA is going to be done for one kg of concrete. This is something that I've done many times before. However, if you are going to compare across two or even three or more materials, then you might have to be fair and do a service-based <clears throat> functional unit, okay, definition which means that you are not going to compare like what I've uh, shown here as an example, one kg of normal concrete with another one kg of green concrete. But you are going to compare the different kinds of material on their mass, but provided that they all provide the same function and same capability. For example, the same compressive strength. So in this case, you might be comparing one kg of concrete with 1.5 kg of green concrete. All right, after knowing this, last but not the least, you have to decide what kind of input and output that you want to study. Okay, in a while, I'm going to show you how knowing what input and output to study will help you to create what we call an LCI, life cycle inventory. But before that, we have to define what is the system boundary that you're interested in. Okay, it is about selecting the different parts, of course, identifying the geographical location of each life cycle stage, and then decide what life cycle stages to consider. This picture will definitely help to understand, help us to understand how we can do that selection. Over here, you see a row of, or rather a column of different life cycle stages, starting from raw materials extraction all the way down to the recycling phase. All right. Depending on the availability and the quality of the data, we have to decide whether we want to do cradle to cradle, that means all the way from raw to recycling, all right? which is everybody's dream. I can, I can assure you this. When I talk to my students and RA, they will say, Prof, can we do a cradle to cradle LCA? By all means, all right? This is the most complete LCA that you can ever do. But you must see whether we can even get the data or not. In most cases, I would find cradle to grave kind of LCA in which you don't talk about recycling, which may not be the point, all right? Especially if your objective is to study the life cycle benefit of recycling, okay? I've also seen people doing cradle to site kind of LCA. It all depends, all right? Every one of them has its own credits, all depending on the objective of your study. So that brings us to the second step. So you see, the very first step takes so many things, okay? It requires you to answer so many questions. So you really need to think whether you want to do an LCA. If you want to do, you, are, you should be all in for it. That brings us to the second step, which is inventory analysis. An example, a picture will tell a thousand words. Right in the middle here, you have the chosen system boundary with all the life cycle stages you want to consider. On the right-hand side, you have the output. And on the left-hand side, the input. This is very important. And by the time you go to the second step now, you should have already identified what are the inputs and output to consider. Then you can draw things out that way. What this helps you to do 
is this. It helps you to know that, for example, if I'm going to look at, for a start, this particular life cycle stage of extraction of natural resources, I know that I need to account for the energy input and the resources input, both renewable and virgin. And for that particular life cycle stage, I also need to look for and quantify as much as I can the pollutions emitted into water, air, and land and whether there are any recycled or recyclable products from this life cycle stage. And if you do that for each and every one of these life cycle stages, you'll find that you have a very complete okay, and rigorous LCA, or in this case, LCI, life cycle inventory to work with. This is one example, which you can find from this particular website. Okay, this is a list of the different inputs for a functional unit of 10 boxes, which means that to make 10 boxes throughout its entire life cycle, I need to have, for example, 76 grams of aluminum hydroxide. So this is for the input. We should have a list for an output table as well. All right. What that means is that in order for me to make 10 cardboard boxes throughout its entire life cycle, okay, I expect to emit about 12.5 grams of carbon monoxide and so on and so forth. But you notice that something isn't quite right with these numbers here. You only have one single number, all right? Is that the average number? Yes, it is. But you must know that in order for us to come up with these numbers, we have to do a lot of searching. I've spoken with uh, people who build data base of all these life cycle inventories. And they have to go to different factories, even to the extent of talking to uh, and commissioning different uh, labs around the world to conduct lab-based experiment to find out how much this emission will be, all right, for me to come up with, let's say 10 boxes, all right, maybe focusing on just the raw material stage. So, in other words, there should be a range of numbers we are talking about. And I explore that in a paper which I published about five, six years ago, right? in which I compare the heavy metal contents of uh, OPC, ordinary Portland cements, and copper slab. And these are the numbers that I found. And there's something that's very distinct to all of you already. Right? All of you have, uh, have trained eyes, so you know what this range means. The uncertainties can actually be quite huge. All right, let's take copper. For one kg of OPC, depending on the, of the sources of the, of the OPC and of data, it can be between 0 0.2 to 2.3 milligrams. So that's an order of magnitude across that range. So this is something that you need to know. Uncertainty analysis has to be done for all life cycle assessment. All right, so that comes, that brings us to impact assessment. All right, in impact assessment, all right, it is about converting the inflows and outflow that we have already uh, tabulated under inventory analysis into the kind of, in, the different types of impact that they will give. For example, greenhouse gas will give us an impact of global warming potential. So fortunately, there's already a, a, a set of um, guidelines okay, and uh, metrics that we can use to convert flows to impacts. So I'm going to give you an example here. In this table, which is again based on that functional unit of 10 cardboard boxes, in the first column, these are just four types of emission throughout the entire life cycle of these 10 boxes. There are quantities of emission right here, second column. And then the next four columns are the different kind of impact classes. So again, I'm using a LCA uh, jargon here, impact classes. Over here, you have uh, GWP, ozone depletion, human toxicity, acidification. Right here, you can see a number. 
Okay, this is what we call a characterization factor, which is a number that you use to multiply the mass in order to convert the flow into the impact. It's very straightforward. But of course, if you are to ask me further how they derive each and every of this characterization factor, that is a subject on its own and it will be another lecture. In fact, uh, one of my ongoing work is to come up with a unique set of characterization factor for one special kind of impact, which has to do with air pollution. Okay, so um, over here, there can be other characterization factors as well for human toxicity. And in a case of carbon monoxide, this is the value. So if you are to sweep your eye across this table, you'll find that a gas such as CO2 has an impact on global warming, but has no significant impact on ozone, human toxicity, and acidification, unless it is in a very confined space. Okay. And for CO, the impact which is most distinguished, uh, which is most distinct and significant will be in the form of human toxicity. And therefore, all the rest you find that there's no values. So when you when you account for all these emissions, and when you multiply the mass of each with the different characterization factor and you add up all these numbers, you will get what we call an effect score. So for example, the effect score for these four emission for global warming potential is only 1.792 and so on and so forth. So what can we do with these numbers, right? Well, we can always compare these numbers with our existing targets. Okay, or our recorded um, effect score of a particular year, let's say 1990, so that we can keep track of our progress when it comes to the life cycle of certain materials that we are interested to assess. And in my case, it will be concrete. So that brings us to the final stage, our final step. And this is where we have to do two kinds of analysis before we draw conclusion from the results. And uh, I'm referring to sensitivity analysis and uncertainty analysis. Once the result is verified, it can be used for different application, including like what I've mentioned earlier on product development, um, material uh, um, comparison, and even design modification. So in order to give you an idea of how we can present the results on LCA, okay, I'm going to show you a few of the graphs that I've published quite a few years ago. In this case, in this graph, you find that there are five clusters of bars, all right? And in each bar, there are different shades, and different shades represent different life cycle stages. Each of these five bars represent the different impact classes. What these kind of graphs can show you very clearly is firstly the dominance of certain life cycle stages when it comes to different impact. For example, for cumulative energy demand, which is more of an inflow into the life cycle stages, you find that this white bar, which is cement production, consumes the most energy. Not surprising there. Right? For those of us in the construction industry, including, of course, uh, Professor Dan Singh, who is also here, we know how much energy is needed to uh, produce uh, cement. There's also another way of presenting LCA result. In this case, we have five clusters of bars as well, each one representing an impact class. But within each impact class, right, you have four bars, and each bar represents, you guess it, different kinds of materials under comparison. And from this kind of uh, display, you can very clearly show okay, which material, which, which option, material option can give you the lowest environmental impact. For example, in a form of acidification potential, human toxicity, and so on and so forth. Last and not the least, over here, all right, you can also use a pie chart for you to sh show the, the share of the emission or the share of a certain environmental impact caused by the different life cycle stages. 
All right. For this particular study, we actually study uh, an entire building in Singapore. And it's quite clear here that the operation of the building okay, accounts for the most, in this case, about 85.74% of the total energy consumption. And there are many more, all right, which I don't intend to cover here. And, uh, um, you know, in life, there are many things that are supposed to be good, but it seems to be very difficult for you to get the, 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 the wholesomeness out of it. All right. And because of that, we run into a dilemma. LCA is the same thing. How LCA is extremely useful. All right. And it is what even, uh, what even some of them call, uh, some of us call consciousness racing okay, in nature because it tells us what actually can go wrong to a material. All right. Maybe not in the use phase, but in the manufacturing phase. To do an LCA is extremely difficult to do. All right. However, things have become better now. Still, okay, I would like to highlight three problems to you. The first is the cost and time involved. Second, it all depends on how you draw the system boundary. All right, your results may differ. Last but not the least, data uncertainty is still something that we have to look very closely at. Although I have to say that um, currently, Many of our colleagues around the world specializing in LCA has been able to do it very well. So we have already talked about LCA, the concepts, way of uh, um, um, going through the ISO standard to get the results. It's time for us to think about how we can expand this life cycle thinking so that we can just we, 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 can, we can don't just look at the environmental impact, but to also look at the impact on cost or costing, as well as the social impact of a certain material. All right. So when you have ELCA, which is environmental LCA, and because of legacy uh, uh, reason, all right, normally we do not say ELCA, but LCA, all right, which is understood to be something of an environmental in nature, all right? And we combine that with the lifestyle costing and social LCA, okay? We get a summation of all these, okay, known as LCSA. This has always been the guiding lights for us. And uh, this is widely recognized as the first framework for doing LCSA. However, not too long ago, thanks to my colleagues and friends from Leiden University, okay, and of course, uh, several universities uh, in, uh, in Europe, they came up with an LCA, um, LCSA framework number two, okay, which they call life cycle sustainability analysis. Let's take a look at what's the difference. So what they did is that they look at um, ISO 14040, which if you remember, it's for LCA, it's not even for um, CLCA. I mean, it's not for uh, uh, LCC, life cycle costing that is. And it's not even for social LCA. It's for the so-called environmental LCA, right? But they use the framework as a basis and inspiration for change. So they, they, they look at what was involved in inventory analysis and impact assessment, which is something that I've already shared about 10 minutes ago. And then they came out with this very interesting idea of combining different modeling efforts, different ways of uh, using empirical data to come up with interpretation. So I'm going to demystify this for you so that you know what this community has been talking about when it comes to LCSA. All right. This is a big picture, but it gives you something which is quite interesting. All right. Um, well, although this is created, this was created in, back in 2009, um, operationalizing this is still a work in progress, I feel. Okay, so let me quickly run you through this so that you can go away with the gist of this model. Leftmost column, you have goal, scope definition, modeling, interpretation. This is basically what they have come up with. Okay, under goal definition, you have all these things that we already talked about, but there are a few things that I'm going to highlight uh, in a while. 
I would like you to focus your attention on the modeling part, what it actually entails. Number one, over here. The highlighted um, text says that when you go from the bottom to the top, there is a broadening in the object of analysis. Okay, broadening of object analysis, meaning that they go from the product level to the economy-wide level. All right. This was traditionally not done under the ISO standard. Okay, when you broaden it, you actually expand the system boundary, which will allow you to do another form of LCA, which I've not touched on today due to time constraint. Okay, it's called consequential life cycle assessment. Something that I've done quite a few times, published quite a few papers on that, on uh, different kinds of building materials. Concurrently, I'd like you to take a look at this horizontal text, which says broadening the scope of indicators. In traditional LCA, as we know by now, we only focus on the environmental performance. But by broadening the scope, we mean that in a true spirit of LCSA, we look at the economic performance indicators as well as social indicators. Okay. And then finally, I would like to highlight that in this new model, the go and set the go and scope setting has some new components in it, including identifying who the stakeholders are. Not explicitly mentioned in the original ISO 14040. Okay. And also in the new framework, okay, there is an emphasis on the different ways of doing uncertainty analysis which I'm happy to, uh, to, to mention, I've contributed a few papers on as well. So in conclusion, um, although there are existing problems with LCA and LCSA, right, they remain to be some of the best and most holistic methodology for doing product and process assessment. All right. Increasingly, LCSA has been uh, receiving um, a global attention, especially back in 2019 when I was still a board member uh, in the LCSA uh, focus group in the International Society for Industrial Ecology. We really pushed very hard to uh, bring LCSA into the limelight. And uh, my team and I, we even uh, um, came out with a special issue on the journal in the Journal of Industrial Ecology focusing on that. Finally, um, as we speak, and I think this is a good thing, LCA and LCSA is being customized to solve more challenging problems. For example, I have a phone, all right? Okay, uh, my phone is not so fantastic, not the newest of model, but a phone is a phone. It can be used and uh, I'm happy uh, with it. The technology of phone will change and the efficiency of production of phone, the components inside will change as well. So there's a time sensitive, uh, a list of sign, uh, time sensitive parameters in doing LCA. So in what is now called dynamic LCA, all right, we account for that as well. So that means when we go through the different steps of LCA, even by following the ISO standard, certain steps, we do not plug in a number. For example, one kg of, uh, of wood, you know, we need, let's say, 10 kg of water, all right, to, 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 to make. We don't do that kind of um, um, inference, but we replace that with a more dynamic way of accounting for resource input. And this is all based on our understanding of how the resource efficiency of the different production process might have changed in the past and will likely to change in the future. So uh, with this, I would like to acknowledge uh, my three key sponsors for all my research so far, the ministry, NRF, and of course, um, uh, NAMIC and AM.NUS. And uh, at this point, I would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, I'm open for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kua, for the interesting and very informative presentation.
So I think now we can start Q&A session. And I do believe that there are a lot of questions from the mm -hmm. participants. So uh, if you have any questions, you could send your questions via chat, um, chat menu. Or uh, if not, you may raise your hand so that uh, we will allow you to talk with the uh, speaker directly. Uh, yes. Now, uh, I sincerely invite Yura Cho to coordinate the Q&A session. Over to you, Yura. Okay, thank you, Amasha. Uh, actually, we've got a few questions for mm -hmm. this lecture uh, during your presentation. And yes. before mentioning that, uh, I think we can invite uh, Christopher from the participant who raised his hand. So, shall we? Can we give him a permission to right. speak up? Is it, is it working? Okay, then while he joins, <laughs> join with his speaker, then uh, I'll give the first. Oh, okay. Then we can start from the question from Konuk who raised the hand. So please go ahead. Okay. Hello, Professor Kwang. Hi. My name is Konu Kwang. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for your great presentation. Oh, yeah, welcome. Uh, uh, I think the system boundary is the mm -hmm. most subjective area yes. because the overall results can be changed significantly depending yes. on the criteria for each person. So then you then how do you examine the objectivity of the system boundary? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, for the benefit of everybody, um, I'm going to share screen so that you know at least uh, uh, we know what project um, system boundary is. Okay, so this is system boundary. This is a uh, this was taken by from one of the papers uh, published by my uh, colleague in NUS. So can you see that? Ah, okay, now you can see, huh? all right. All right, um, the good news is that, yes, there is, there is um, uh, some guidelines as to what kind of, um, uh, what kind of, what kind of uh, life cycle stages that we should include in a system boundary, right? I'm gonna give you a few examples. Let's say that I'm interested to do um, an LCA on um, the recycling of uh, building materials. Okay, so what we have to do is to ideally go all the way from raw materials to the recycling stage. So that is a cradle to cradle perspective. So it therefore doesn't make sense if my research objective is to do um, is to account for the um, life cycle impact of a different recycling approach, right? If my system boundary does not involve the recycling phase at all. So that is one um, methodological uh, guideline, right? For us to, 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 to decide whether a certain LCA is even logical or not, all right? Next, there's one thing, there's one uh, particular aspect that we always uh, find uh, many people um, um, arguing over and uh, not necessarily they will agree uh, eye to eye on. And that is transportation, right? In a small country like Singapore, transporting of materials in between different life cycle stages. And in our case, because we import uh, many of the resources that we need from the, um, from the, um, from, the port of entry all the way to our storage, uh, our storage house or storage uh, places uh, inland. At most, I would say, or should I say on the average, it's about 25 kilometers. All right. We have done our calculation. We find that 25 kilometers, the impact caused by that transportation distance is not as large as, for example, the resources used for raw material extraction in some of the countries that we are getting this particular materials from. So for me, whenever I write a paper or whenever I 
evaluate review a paper. When the reviewer, or, or rather when the author say that, oh, I have uh, decided to ignore the transportation stage. To me, that is a red flag. I would at least want to see that the transportation stage has been accounted for. And then to be convinced that in fact, he's right or they are right to say that the transportation impact is much lower than the impact caused by other life cycle stages. So again, this is um, a way of uh, checking the quality of LCA. And, uh, and um, let me give you another example. Building, okay? Whole building type LCA. This is a, um, a very popular uh, subject for doing LCA. And because it's so popular, through the years, we know roughly which is the life cycle stage that will give you the highest energy consumption. And in fact, just now I've already shown you one such example, and it is the use phase, all right? The use phase of that particular building. I also published an article to, uh, to argue that for certain building, all right, the energy consumption for the use phase is actually of the same order of magnitude as the energy consumption and the emission in the waste disposal stage of building. Yeah, so this is how you get an idea from the literature, especially on a topic which is popular. You have an idea of what are the key life cycle stage that you should not ignore. And based on that, you can decide what are the good ones and what are the not so complete and not so rigorous LCAs. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for your answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, for second question, if Christopher is ready, you can raise your hand, we will give you... Oh, okay, I think he's ready now. You can speak Okay, up. yeah. Um, thank you very much, Professor Kwa. I think um, you have actually laid a very good foundation for um, those of us who are new into life cycle assessment. So mm -hmm. my question is, how do you, because when you want to get the energy input for materials, sometimes you have to consult with manufacturers. Yes. But sometimes these manufacturers, due to proprietary concerns, mm -hmm. they would not want to share some information. Yes. So mm -hmm. how have you been dealing with that over time? That is one. Then number two, I understand that there are a lot of times that you have to make assumptions. Mm -hmm. So that makes the life cycle assessment, that introduces some level of subjectivity. Yes. So mm -hmm. how, like in the, I know ISO 14040 um, uh -huh. standard, but how does it account for subjectivity? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very interesting question. Uh, in fact, questions, there are two. Um, I'm more than happy to share with you uh, my, 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 um, my opinion on two of them. First one, all right, source of data. Well, um, many of the LCAs done today, all right, are based on um, data available in database, all right? So do you know how the database is built in the first place? Well, um, let's say Gabi or even... Uh, a widely used um, um, database and uh, software for doing LCS, Sima Pro, right? They do have, all right, very well qualified um, group of uh, professionals who are always very busy going out, gathering data from the different uh, manufacturer to, uh, to um, uh, in order to populate the database. I know because I've spoken with them for uh, in a conference, uh, in UK. So all this work, all right, all this work provided by what you say that there's no proprietary issues involved. Those materials for which I've been doing my LCA on are the more commonly used building materials like cement, concrete, and so on. But if they are proprietary products, will there be a problem? Yes, there will be a problem. So in our in our um, LCA, how do we go around the problem? Well, we'll always try to look for a product closest to the product under study. Let me give you an example. All right. Um, recently, I finished a, a, a LCA report 
in which I'm asked to study about 15 different kinds of plastic uh, containers, right? For the government and later on for um, a private company. So many of these new products, they come up with different ways of making plastic, different um, catalysts, different chemicals, different additives. Wow. And to, to firstly, to understand the process takes time. That is provided they even tell you the process of making this. So what do we do? All right. We have to make assumption. And that brings me to your second question. Right. We make assumption based on different things. For example, if we are lucky enough, we'll be able to find out, let's say for a certain uh, new kind of plastic, what is the percentage of, let's say polypropylene, PP, that is inside. And what is the, the percentage of additives? And is that additive based on, you name it, maybe copper or what? We do the best we can, all right? That is almost like a material detective, you know, something like forensic, but just that we are doing forensic on plastic. We have to break it down as much as we can, find out the, the, um, the, the percentage of the different known materials, and then we decide what is the major component in the plastic, and we do an LCA based on that. That is an assumption, and we have to very, very clearly state that in our publication. Yeah, you are absolutely right. Why, if this is my invention, why should I tell you, okay, what goes behind the scene for me to come out with this plastic? No way. So we have to make assumption. There's another kind of assumption that is very widely used and it has to do with the way we verify those uh, data and coefficients of parameters that we extract from database. Okay, where are you from, uh, Christopher? May I ask? I am calling from Canada. Ah, okay. Yeah. All right. Let's say if I'm getting um, certain data from a publication or database from Canada. All right. And I say, okay, one kg of cement made in uh, Canada, all right, um, will emit or will require certain amount of water. Or let's make it even more direct, will emit certain amount of uh, greenhouse gas due to an X amount of energy consumption. Energy from electricity, okay? So once I adopt that, that number, I have to then ask myself, how accurate is that number going to be if I'm going to talk about Singapore or if I'm going to talk about Malaysia, okay? Because Malaysia is using a different energy fuel mix compared to Canada. So I need to do that conversion, you see. I've seen many cases in which people just go into the database, open it up, take the number, apply it, and say, yes, this is for Singapore. It doesn't work that way. Okay, that is a kind of assumption that is not rigorous and we shouldn't do it. We should at least do an energy conversion, meaning that I have to base on my country or the country of my interest energy mix, all right? and then do a conversion based on that so that I can adopt and adapt the data which I obtained from Canada for my LCA. This is okay. very helpful. Thank you so much. Thank yeah, you. You're most welcome, Christopher. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There is a question by Boris, right? Oh, yes, Shall I, shall okay. I read it for you? Okay. Uh, yeah. He, mm -hmm. yeah, he told right. that like, in your opinion, to uh -huh. what level can the LCA study be modified or influenced by the customer in order to argue for their cause? So for instance, uh, it could be a lithium, a lithium ion batteries for electric mm -hmm. car producers. Mm -hmm. And in your opinion, how often does that happen? Okay. From Boris. Very interesting question. Um, okay, let me, let me give you an idea of um, how multidisciplinary an LCA study is and should be, right? Um, let's say I'm going to have uh, this particular company come to us and say, hey, Han Wei, can you do us an LCA for lithium ion battery, uh, batteries? Right? It all depends on how much you know about lithium uh, um, um, ion batteries, all right? Um, well, I am not an expert, but if I were to approach this, I'm going to talk to an expert 
right? Maybe sit down for a cup of coffee and uh, tea. Quite difficult now because of the pandemic. But I'm going to ask this expert a few questions. What do you think okay, is the most pressing environmental issue when it comes to lithium battery? Is it because of uh, environmental pollution? If yes, in what sense? Is it because of the way we throw away the lithium battery? Or is it because of, um, well, the materials that we need to make lithium battery? You need to talk to the people who are the expert. So you take down notes to find out what are the environmental issues that you should be looking at. Come prepared before you go and talk to the company. So when a company says, oh, you don't have to study this chemical, X, Y, Z, but when you look and you find that, hey, X, Y, Z is extremely important, all right? How do you know I'm not an expert? Well, because you have spoken to your friends, your colleagues who are experts. So with this kind of triangulation, you will be very sure that you will not miss out on any extremely important issues when it comes to doing LC. And that will help you to avoid, you know, the companies controlling the agenda. What's wrong with the company controlling the agenda, right? Okay, um, I'm going to give this company the benefit of doubts. Maybe they do not know um, the details or the possible impact due to their material. So, because you have spoken with your expert friends, all right, maybe from another department in your university, you now have a better idea of the possible harm. All right, possible harm due to the battery. So by you coming in and suggesting to the company, they may have a better understanding of the life cycle environmental impact due to the battery. So you can approach it that way. So the long story short, um, if it is not a material in which you are an expert in, it's better for you to work as a team. Okay. And actually, he gave second comment for your answer and mentioned that like, essentially, how much can we trust the objectivity of the LCA study paid by the company whose project is dependent on it? Ah, okay, so um, there are a few ways that you can approach it. I mean, I've done a few LCA studies for companies, so I know. Um, first of all, you have to know who is the party who have conducted the LCA. And, uh, and of course, when you're reading the LCA itself, right? when you're reading the LCA itself, and if you know LCA, and if the report of that study is, uh, is very detailed, it's very easy for us to just one glance, we know, ah, okay, there's a loophole here, or these are the things that should have been done, but it is not done properly. So almost immediately, I would say, the very, very experienced ones, okay, uh, uh, LCA, either practitioner or researcher, they'll be able to pick this up very clearly. Of course, this is only possible if you are talking about a report which is very detailed, all right, done and written up by this group of researchers. All right. You can also approach from uh, another angle, and that's the angle of um, maybe not to uh, look at the report. Who knows? Maybe the report is not even uh, available. Well, you can always talk to the company, provided the company wants to talk to you. Ask the co uh, correct question. And, uh, you know, those questions that you guys have asked me, these are good questions for, for you to get an idea whether the LCA is done properly or not. Yeah. And based on the answer, you have an idea. And of course, if you feel that the methodology done or adopted is not rigorous, then of course, there's no reason why you, sh you should trust the results 100%. Mm -hmm. It seems like uh, Boris got a good answer for the question. And uh, yeah, we got one more from Christopher again. And okay. he said, uh, could you recommend any textbook that lays a good fund uh, foundation for LCA and LCSA? Yes. Um, when I was a, um, a graduate student, and that was uh, again many, many years ago, I think I keep saying this that. Uh, uh, most of you would think that I'm very old. But um, when, I, when I get started on LCA, right, um, one of the key resources that I've turned to just to get an overall idea of LCA okay, is one written by a particular Yale professor. I know him uh, personally, uh, Professor Thomas Gradle or Tom Gradle. 
okay? And uh, he has written quite a few, all right? And uh, you can even uh, go Google his name and then comma LCA textbook. These are very good uh, places for you to uh, get started. Yeah, if you are talking about um, LCA. LCSA, I'm not aware of any um, 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 good textbook out there for now. But having said that, there are a few good edited books, okay? meaning that these are books with different ch chapters. I mean, you all know, you're all uh, experienced uh, researchers here and, uh, and uh, upper level uh, research students. Okay? Um, edited books are a good resource, okay? provided you already know some of the uh, basics. What happens if you don't have the basic, you cannot find a good book on LCSA and you want to get started? Okay, then follow what I'm trying to say, right? Remember I, I presented just now that in LCSA, there are two framework, framework one, and then uh, my friends uh, um, in, uh, um, in Europe came out with a framework number two, all right? Actually, I came out with framework three, but um, um, I have no time to, to, to look at, uh, to go into that. Try the framework one for a start. Because if you can still remember framework one, uh, okay, for the benefit of all of us here, I'm going to share screen and remind you what is the meaning of the framework one. All right. And then with that diagram, you'll be clearer about how to approach LCSA, this one. Okay. You can approach LCSA by spending time understanding LCA on the left and in the middle here, life cycle costing. Okay, life cycle costing is something which is very interesting. It is about you accounting for the cost, okay, of a product throughout its entire life cycle. Capital outlay, maintenance costs, replacement costs, right, end of life benefit or um, residual benefit, right? And then in the end, account for the net present value of a certain material. That goes under LCC. In fact, um, many of our PhD students, when they do um, LCSA, they will do LCA and LCC, all right, without um, doing the social uh, LCA yet. So social LCA will always come later. So talking about social LCA, there's already uh, a, a wealth of uh, literature out there that tells us how and what kind of uh, social related indicators to pick for the social LCA. For example, salary, okay, work environment, and so on. So some are quantitative, some are qualitative. So if you go through this, all right, read some papers on social LCA, you will have a better idea of what are the things that people talk about okay, in uh, LCSA. That will give you a very good uh, conceptual uh, foot and uh, uh, foundation. Thank you for your comprehensive answer. And I believe there will be more questions from the audience, but due to the time limitation, I think we could keep it for the next opportunity to yes. meet you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much, Yura. So uh, thank you everyone. So this is the end of the APRU Sustainable Waste Management Virtual School on Life Cycle Assessment and Life Cycle Sustainable Assessment for Global Sustainability. So I would like to uh, extend my sincere gratitude and appreciation to Professor Kua for your valuable contribution and for sharing your knowledge with us during this uh, during your busy schedules. And uh, I also extend my special thanks to Professor Young Sik Oak for organizing this great event. And finally, thank you all the panelists and all the participants for attending this event and bringing your expertise to this gathering. And uh, thank you once again and have a great day, you all. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Have a good weekend too. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much, Professor.